Hello everyone and welcome back. Before we continue on, I will remind you again that I am not a lawyer of any kind and I am not certified to practice law here in Vietnam. I'm just simply a foreigner from the United States who knows about the labor code. Now, when we left off, we were talking about material responsibility. What happens when you go ahead and break something? And if I remember rightly, we stopped off right about here. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and continue on from here. And then we're just going to go ahead and see where it takes us. So we're going to go ahead and continue on with this. Article 130, Determination of Compensation. Consideration, Clause 1, Consideration and decision on the level of compensation for damage shall be based on the nature of the offense, the actual extent of damage, the situation of the offender or the offender's family, and financial capacity of the employee. Clause 2. The government shall provide procedures and time limits for claiming damages. Now, what this means is that consideration will be issued based on things like, you know, how bad it was, the situation of the offender, financial capacity to be able to pay back, stuff like that. So lots of things will be taken into consideration when they ask for compensation for damage. Now, how this applies to English teachers is very simple. Normally, when you go to an English center, they will go ahead and loan you books and stuff like that for you to use. Well, what happens is you go ahead and return those books in good or better condition than what you received them in. Now, if you receive them brand new, then they should be returned gently used. If you have gently used, it should be returned as such. However, if a book is already used, then the compensation should be lower than a brand new book because if you're – loan a brand new book and you destroy it, yeah, you have to buy a new book for the English Center. However, if you have a used book and it gets destroyed for whatever reason, then the compensation shouldn't be that high because it was a used book, not new. You know, buy like item for like item. I doubt you'll be able to find a used textbook you can go ahead and buy to give to the English Center. So, yeah. I'm a big fan of like item for like item. If it's new, buy new. If it's used, buy used. Don't give the English Center an upgrade. If you, for some other reason, you don't have a... <coughs> if you don't have the cash to go ahead and pay for a new book, well, I don't think that they're going to go ahead and press charges on you for destroying a book. More than likely, they'll, they'll just take it out of your salary. So... Moving on. Article 131, Complaints on Labor Disciplinary Regulations and Material Responsibility. Now, this one I want you to pay attention to really, really well. If you're going through a disciplinary procedure or if you're being disciplined, okay, let's just go ahead and read it like this. And we'll move on from there. If the employee who is disciplined, suspended from work, or required to pay compensation is not satisfied with the decision, he or she has the right to file a complaint to the employer or a competent authority as prescribed by law or a competent authority as prescribed by law or request settlement of the labor dispute in accordance with the procedures stipulated by law. The government shall elaborate this article. Excuse me. All right, now moving on. So what this means is that if you are not satisfied with the decision, which most employees wouldn't be, you can go ahead and file a complaint. Now, a competent authority as prescribed by law. What does that mean? It's very simple. What you do is that you find the people's committee of the district in which you live in. Now, you have to find this specific building. You can't use the ward level or anything else. You have to go to the actual district level people's committee building. Because inside of that, there will be a smaller room that has the labor office there. That's the room you have to go to to file your complaint. Now, obviously, not a lot of labor workers are going to be able to speak English. So you're going to have to go ahead and have an interpreter with you that can speak Vietnamese so they can speak with the labor representatives and tell them what's going on. So, yeah. If you speak English, you will need a Vietnamese interpreter, or if you're plucky like me, you can go ahead and use Google Translator and get your point across. All right. Now, just like I said in all my previous videos, yes, I'm still a little sick. That's why I'm still coughing. 
but I want to go ahead and get these videos out here so that people can go ahead and learn their rights. So you'll just have to put up with me making noises and stuff like that while I'm making these videos. So, moving on. Occupational Safety and Health. Chapter 9. <laughs> Reason why this is important is simple. There is an actual law, a separate law book on occupational safety and health. But what this means is that the occupational safety and health in general means that your employer is required by law to make sure that you're safe. Essentially, they need to make sure that you're following correct procedures, you're wearing proper protection, you're doing everything properly so that you don't mess up. You see what I mean? So that you don't mess up. Now, we're going to go ahead and actually read these laws out, and we're going to move on. Just like I always say, English, Vietnamese. Why do I do a, a duel like this? It's very simple. Because in case somebody who actually knows Vietnamese thoroughly, they can see that this and this both match. That's the reason why I do what I do. <laughs> Moving on. Article 132, Compliance with the Law on Occupational Safety and Health. Employers, employees, organizations, and individuals involved in labor and business operation shall comply with the regulations of law of the law on occupational safety and health. So Article 132 says that employers are required to follow the law on occupational safety and health. Now for people like me that actually want to wear masks and use hand sanitizer and get vaccines and you know stuff like that, we can actually push for our employers to give us masks and hand sanitizer as it is required by law as PPE. And it's considered PPE for English teachers because of the fact we're in schools all day. And especially in Ho Chi Minh City, it's required to wear a mask currently in public schools. So for all the English teachers that live in Ho Chi Minh City that aren't wearing a mask, don't use hand sanitizer, don't believe in getting vaccines, and they're teaching in public schools, you should go home. Stop spreading the virus and go home. Yeah, I, I don't tolerate anti-maskers, anti-vaxxers, anybody like that. If you think your vanity is more important than your students' health and safety, you should go home. Moving on. Article 133, Occupational Safety and Health Program. Clause 1. The government shall decide on development of the national program on occupational safety and health. Clause 2. The People's Committee of every province shall submit... Bleh, shall submit a provincial occupational safety and health program to the People's Council of the same province for inclusion to the socioeconomic development plan. What this means that the government will go ahead and decide the national occupational safety and health program and that they'll also and that the People's Committee of every province will go ahead and submit a plan to the People's Council of the same province for inclusion in the development plan. So that's the only real way I can go ahead and, and explain that. Now, there is a separate law, and I actually do have it, and it's still valid, but we're not going to dive into that because that's really, really long. So one more thing, and then we'll go ahead and move on to somewhere else. Now, we already, we already covered that, so don't worry about it. Article 134, Ensuring Occupational Safety and Health at the Workplace, Clause 1. Employers shall fully implement the measures for ensuring occupational safety and health at the workplace. Dun, 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 dun. Ensuring occupational safety and health at the workplace. Clause 1. Employers shall fully implement the measures for ensuring occupational safety and health at the workplace. This also means that they must comply with occupational safety and health. So if you actually care about this stuff, press your employer. They must do it. And you know what's funny is that according to the law on occupational safety and health, each employer must have at least one person that is an occupational safety and health officer. Yeah, I bet you didn't know that either, did you? Yep, it's true. It's actually in the occupational safety and health laws. I've seen it. Clause 2. Employees shall comply with rules and procedures for occupational safety and health. Regulations of law, obtain knowledge and skills on assurance of occupational, occupational safety and health the workplace. <laughs> now, why is this important? Well, that's very simple. This is for 
again, like I mentioned earlier, people like, you know, English teachers who don't believe in wearing masks and don't believe in getting vaccines and who don't like to use hand sanitizer. They like to go ahead and touch everything, cough, open mouth. You know, they like to spread diseases and stuff like that. Yeah, this right here says that you must, you know, comply with the rules on occupational safety and health, which means you must wear a mask when viruses are present. You must use hand sanitizer to cut down the risk of spreading germs. And you must get a vaccine to go ahead and prevent the disease from spreading further. So, yeah, you must comply with the rules and procedures for occupational safety and health. Regulations of law obtain knowledge and skills on assurance of occupational safety and health of the workplace. So, yeah. Now, before we go ahead and move on to other parts of the labor code, I just wanted to go ahead and say this. Occupational safety and health is a very serious thing, especially for English teachers, English centers and such. Because of the fact, because of the fact that English teachers go through a lot every single day, English teachers have to get up from wherever they're at in the city. They have to go to the school. They have to teach classes sometimes all day. Then they have to go home. Now, if you're around 50 students and you have about nine classes, so you have 50 students times nine. How much is that? That's about what? Mm, 450 students if you're seeing about 450 students a day you're not wearing a mask you're not using hand sanitizer you like to open mouth cough and do anything else what are the chances of you getting sick and spreading the virus to other people yeah wear a mask get your vaccines use hand sanitizer stop the spread of diseases plain and simple but this also goes ahead and deals with things like, you know, slip and falls and stuff like that. I've noticed a lot of people here in the school, public schools, they just mop. They don't care. They don't put up wet floor signs. They don't do anything else. They just mop. And if kids fall down, they fall down. That's a lawsuit in America because if you mop a floor, you don't put up a wet floor sign, someone slips and falls, you get sued. Yeah. Anywho, let's move on. So. Shoot, let's see. Um, we're going to go ahead and move on. I forgot to set my timer again, so we're going to go ahead and check and see how much time I got left. Um, it looks like we got about roughly about 15 minutes left. So I got about until 55 after. Okay, cool. Yeah, I really need to remember to go ahead and set the timer so I don't have to keep doing this. All right, cool. So we got about 15 minutes left. We already went through this earlier in a separate video, the provisions applicable to female employees and assurance of gender equality. We already went through that one, and that actually, I think, was one of my best videos. One of my best videos. Now, here's the thing. Earlier, you would see something about protecting vulnerable employees. I think it was under the discrimination clause. Elderly, minor, and female employees are considered vulnerable employee groups. So we don't need to look at any of these rules about minors because no purse, no English center employs minors. Elderly employees. Now, elderly employees are employed by English centers, but normally as security guards. But the thing is, though, is that that's, again, something we don't really need to cover because it's not something we really need to worry about right now. Moving on. So, we are going to go ahead and roll through this and see what else we can go ahead and do. So here's some odds and ends labor codes since I think we're just about done with this part. I want to go ahead and make the next few videos pretty much just odds and ends labor codes that I think you need to know. Once this entire series is done, I will go ahead and make a beginning video, LC000, that will explain the entire thing in one go. So. We're going to go ahead and get through this. I went ahead and rolled up to Article 151, which I did cite before, that I wanted you to get a better scope of the requirements for foreigners to work, excuse me, for foreigners to work in Vietnam. Right there. So Article 151, Article 151. Boom, boom. <laughs> mm, excuse me. Yeah, I know I'm coughing a lot, but at the same time, it's, I'm still getting over whatever this is that I got. So, yeah. And plus, I have to have the AC on. It is hot in this room, you know. During the daytime, it gets hot, and at night, it keeps the heat because it's brick. Anywho, I'm going to take a drink. Give me a second. Ah, oh, my
much better. All right, let's move on. So Article 151, Requirements for Foreigners to Work in Vietnam. Clause 1, a foreign employee means a person who, is, who has a foreign nationality and is at least 18 years of age and has full legal capacity. Now, you should know that to be an English teacher, I think the minimum age is 21. If I remember rightly, the minimum age is 21. Some people said 23, but I doubt that. Now, has the qualifications, occupational skills, practice experience, and adequate health as prescribed by the Minister of Health? That's self-explanatory. Is not serving a sentence, does not have an unspent conviction, is not undergoing criminal prosecution under his or her home country's law or Vietnam's law. Again, self-explanatory. Now, clause, subclause D. Pay attention to this one, folks. Has a work permit granted by a competent authority of Vietnam except in the cases stipulated in Article 154 of this labor code? Mm -hmm. Remember one of the first videos I did, Article 154, Clause 8. In Article 8, Clause 2 of Decree 152-2020, NDCP. Yep. Clause 2. The duration of a foreign employee's employment contract. Please pay attention to this. Please, please, please pay attention to this. The duration of a foreign employee's employment contract must not exceed that of the work permit. When a foreign employee in Vietnam is recruited, both parties may negotiate conclusion of multiple fixed-term labor contracts which means the foreign employee can have many multiple fixed term contracts not just two or whatever else like what the uh previous code said so multiple fixed term contracts foreign employees working in vietnam shall comply with and shall be protected by the labor law of vietnam unless otherwise pres prescribed by treaties to which vietnam is a signatory again we've already went over that foreign employees are protected by the labor code of vietnam and for anyone who says otherwise, you're a fool. Moving on. Article 152. Again, I know we covered this. But essentially what we've already went ahead and gone over this that, you know. Okay, we'll just go ahead and read it again because there's uh, definitely time. So Article 152, Requirements for Employment of Foreigners in Vietnam. Clause 1. Enterprises, organizations, individuals, and contractors shall only employ foreigners to hold positions of managers, executive directors, specialists, and technical workers, the professional requirements for which cannot be met by Vietnamese workers. This means that foreigners can only work certain jobs that only foreigners can do. Foreigners are not allowed to work local jobs, even though there's thousands of local jobs available and no local citizens want them. Mm-hmm. I tried signing up for Concentrix for their customer service position because I'm a natural native English speaker. And they refused to hire me. Yeah, Concentrix here in District 12 refused to hire me because I'm a natural native English speaker. Mm -hmm. And they keep advertising for that job all the time on Facebook. They don't want to hire me because I'm a natural native English speaker. So... Moving on, Clause 2. Recruitment of foreign employees in Vietnam shall be explained and subject to written approval by competent authorities. That means competent authorities regulate the recruitment of uh, foreign employees. Clause 3. Before recruiting foreign employees in Vietnam, a contractor shall list the positions, necessary qualifications, skills, experience, and employment period of the contract and obtain a written approval from a competent authority. Self-explanatory. Now... We're going to go ahead and move on to Article 153, Responsibilities of Employees and Employers and Foreign Employees, Article 153, 153. Excuse me. Foreign employees shall present their work permits whenever requested by competent authorities. Now, a lot of English centers, they like to go ahead and hold your work permit for you. Now... Technically, in my opinion, it's not right because Article 17, Clause 1, which states they shouldn't hold any of your original identity documents, which is true. But in my opinion, they shouldn't hold your work permit either because it's something that's of you. You know, that has your picture in it. It has your information in it. You should have it, not them. But on the employer's side, I can see where they're coming from because if the Ministry of Labor, Ministry of Education, or whoever decides to come by and do a surprise inspection, they have to have the work permits right there to go ahead and show the competent authorities 
so that everything is quote unquote legitimate. So that's why they have to do that. But what you can do is specifically ask your employer to give you a notarized copy of your work permit. Why? It's simple. So that you can go ahead and make, I'd say, another copy. And you keep one copy on you at all times, the other copy at your house, so that if by whatever unfortunate accident or whatever happens, that competent authorities come to your school and they're like, hey, show me your work permit. There you go. So if you already have it on you, that's better for you. So, anywho, we're going to go ahead and move on since we still have a little bit of time left. We're going to go ahead and talk about Article 154 in its entirety just because we have time, so why not? So, Article 154, Work Permit Exemption for Foreign Employees in Vietnam. <laughs> yeah, I already told you uh, guys and gals that I am coughing a lot, so I'm sorry. But again, I wanted to put these videos out here so that everybody can see and know their rights. Let's move on. A foreign employee is not required to have the work permit if he or she, Clause 1, is the owner or capital contributor of a limited liability company with a capital contribution value conformable with regulations of the government. Normally about, mm, oh, if I remember rightly, if you want a comfortable investment amount, you would have to talk about at least two, three hundred million. Thereabouts, minimum. I think one billion is a bit of a stretch, but I think two, three hundred million, I think is about right. Clause two, is the chairperson or a member of the board of directors of a joint stock company a capital contribution value conformable with regulations of the government? Same thing. Clause three. Is the manager of a representative office, project, or the person in charge of the operation of an international organization or a foreign non-governmental organization in Vietnam? Foreign NGO. So, essentially, how do I put this? Person in charge of the operation. Person in charge. That does not mean all NGO employees, only the person in charge. Now... Clause 4. Enters Vietnam for a period of less than three months to do marketing of a service. So if you come to Vietnam and you want to go ahead and market a product, you can do that for less than three months and it's totally fine. Clause 5. Enters Vietnam for a period of less than three months to resolve complicated technical or technological issues which, one, affects or threatens to affect business operations, and two, cannot be resolved by Vietnamese experts or any other foreign experts currently in Vietnam. Clause 6. Is a foreign lawyer. Who has been granted a lawyer's practicing certificate in Vietnam in accordance with the law on lawyers? Clause 7. In one of the cases specified in an international treaty to which the Socialist Republic of Vietnam is a signatory. Gets married with a Vietnamese citizen and wishes to reside in Vietnam. That's me. Clause 9. Other circumstances specified by the government. Now, Clause 7, in one of the cases specified in an international treaty to which the Socialist Republic of Vietnam is a signatory. Now, I'm not up to date on international treaties. So, if Vietnam has a treaty with another country that says their foreign workers don't need a work permit, that's totally fine. That's the law. That's fine. I have no issue with that. Now, we already talked about Article 155. But I'm just going to say it again because we're we're basically filling in time here. The maximum duration of a work permit is two years. A work permit may be extended once for up to two more years. But remember, foreign employees can go ahead and have multiple employment contracts. And every employment contract is tied to your work permit. Just remember that. Article 156, cases in which a work permit is invalid. Please, please, please pay attention to this. Cases in which a work permit is invalid. Clause 1, the work permit expires. Yeah, you better pay attention to your end date because if you don't pay attention to the end date, it's going to be worse for you if, when it expires and then you have to go through the procedures all over again to get a new one instead of just renewing it. The employment contract is terminated right here. When your employment is terminated, your work permit is also terminated. Now, a lot of people will say that your TRC card, your business type TRC card is also tied to your work permit. Some people say yes, some people say no. In my opinion, I say yes because you have to have the work permit to get the TRC card. 
well, you got to have – needless to say, you have to have TRC card to get the work permit, but at the same time, if the work permit's not valid anymore, that means the TRC card ain't valid anymore also because they're both tied together. So lose your job, lose your work permit, lose your TRC card. Clause 3, the contents of the employment contract are inconsistent with the contents of the work permit granted. Meaning if they label you as a bricklayer and you're in and you're teaching English, yeah, that's not right. Clause four. The work performed is not conformable with the contents of the work permit granted. Same thing. Clause three and clause four, I think, are the exact same thing. Because the contents of the employment contract and work performed, I think, are basically the same thing. Clause five. The contract that is the basis for issuance of the work permit expires or is terminated. Again, same thing. Clause 5 and I think Clause 1 are the exact same thing. Clause 5 and Clause 1 are the exact same thing. Clause 6. The foreign party issues a written notice which terminates the dispatch of the foreign employee to Vietnam. So if a foreign company sends a written notice that terminates the dispatch of the foreign employee to Vietnam, then poof, no work permit. Now, the Vietnamese party or foreign organization that hires a foreign employee ceases the operation. And then, number eight, the work permit is revoked. Yep, your work permit can be revoked for many, many, many reasons. Don't make your employers angry. See, the thing is, though, is the fact that when I say don't make your employers angry, what I mean is don't do anything stupid that will cause them to get upset. See, there are many ways to go ahead and get your point across without making your employers angry. But eventually, you're going to make them angry anyways. So as long as you have clear evidence that is on your side, you will not have anything to worry about. Now, I'm going to go ahead and cut this video a little short because I have other things I need to do real quick. So what I'm going to go ahead and say is simple. I am going to go ahead and make the next video about basically odds and ends labor codes and stuff like that. So what I'm going to do is say that if you like my videos, please make sure to like, share, subscribe, comment, hit that notification bell so that you'll be notified every time I make new videos. <coughs> and also, if you like what I do and you would like to donate or tip me, please send your tip donation request to tuxedoshadow at gmail.com. You can either send me an email or you can use the Google Chat app. I really, really need donations and tips and stuff like that to help keep this channel running. Also, you can go ahead and visit the Zalo group if you have Zalo here in Vietnam for the English teachers group that I run. Now, it is not a job board. It is basically a place for people to learn their rights and basically talk about it and whatnot. So what I'm going to say is have a good day, be safe, and I'll see you again soon.